Praise the Lord, everybody. Um, well, how about this? Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Um, I know if you aren't here, um, you don't feel what's going on here, but we just, uh, for the last 30, 40 minutes, we have experienced the greatest move of God that I think I've ever felt in this place, and I'm just so thankful that the Lord showed up. I did pray, and I did ask Him that He would fill the house this morning, that He would fill it with angels, that He would especially fill it with His presence, <clears throat> and I just felt such a incredible move of God in this place, so I'm very thankful for that. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, and then go on down to verse number 13. I'm, a, I'm incredibly indebted this morning to the Lord Jesus Christ. I keep thinking about all that he's done for me. He died for me. He made a way for me to get to heaven. And I just want to love him and honor him the way that he wants to be loved and honored and pursued. I'm so thankful. I, I prayed not long ago, and I just said, Lord, you got to help me to understand the love of God. And, and the Lord just opened some things up to me and showed me some things and and really put some things into my life that I'm just incredibly grateful for. Uh, so while we were having this incredible move of God this morning, um, <clears throat> I have I, I was praying, and I just said, Lord, just let this go. I, I don't want to do anything but worship you. And uh, I felt like he said, no, um, you're going to be preaching this morning. And so I, I tell you this, with the help of the Lord, with the help of the Lord, I, I have a little bit of a starting point here, um, but where this ends and, and where it goes, um, I'm not entirely sure yet. But if you're at Second Kings chapter 2, scroll on down to verse number 13. And uh, <clears throat> I'm starting kind of in the middle of a story here, but I, I feel like we can get it on track with this. Second um, Kings chapter 2, verse 13 says this, And he, or Elisha, uh, took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he went back and he stood by the bank of the Jordan, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, or one way and the other. And Elisha went over, and when, he, when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, or uh, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. And they came to meet him, and they bowed themselves to the ground before him. And then it goes on in verse 16, and it says this. And they, or the sons of the prophets, said to him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, to seek thy master Elijah, lest preadventure, or because the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him on some mountain or in some valley, and he said, you shall not go. You're not going to go. You don't have to go. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, go ahead. And they sent therefore 50 men, and they sought three days, and they didn't find Elijah anywhere. And they came again to Elisha, for he tarried at Jericho. And he said unto them, did not I say unto you, don't go, don't go. So from this portion of Scripture, I want to speak something along these lines. This is something God has laid upon my heart. I want to speak about dismantled. Um, thank the Lord. Dismantled. If you wouldn't mind, just take your Bibles down or set your Bibles down wherever you are. If you're in the comfort of your own home and your easy chair, uh, I would just ask you to set them down and to lift your voice and lift your hands unto the Lord. If you happen to be driving, don't close your eyes, but you can worship God. I praise you, Jesus. I exalt you. I exalt you, Almighty God. Lord Jesus, there is none like you. There is none like you, Almighty God. Lord, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the great I am. And I worship you today. I worship you. I pray today, God, Lord, help me, Jesus. Just 
allow me, Lord, to hear your voice and speak your words. Lord, fill my heart with the things of God. And Lord, let every ear that hears be an ear that's been molded and tuned perfectly to receive the Word of God today. Lord Jesus, we love you and we honor you today. If you could, wherever you are, just clap your hands under the Lord. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you. I worship you, Almighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. If you are standing at home, you may be seated. If you're standing in church, you can be seated. If you're standing while you're driving, I don't know what to tell you to do. Uh, but anyway, God bless you. Uh, thank the Lord. I, uh, Elijah, um, <coughs> who is, he, he really is, I think, my favorite Bible character. When you start going through the life and the, the um, what Elijah did and how he did it, and truthfully, Elijah comes on the scene really quickly and he leaves pretty quickly. Um, we read about first about Elijah in First Kings, I think it's chapter seventeen, and there's something very clear that happens in First Kings chapter seventeen. Elijah comes on the scene. Um, and he says these words. He says, it's not going to rain again until I say it's going to rain. And there's something about the words of Elijah that the people around him seem to know, seem to understand, that when Elijah spoke those words, that what Elijah spoke was coming from God. And what God had decided was being channeled or funneled through that man. He, he was a, a, a mouthpiece for God. He was a voice of God. And, and the Lord had decreed because of the wickedness of the king and the queen and because of the wickedness that Israel had gotten into that it would not rain. It did not rain for the space of three and a half years. Read the story. It, it's a remarkable story. But what we find in the life of Elijah, and again, it's rather short, uh, short story to read about um, really his what we know about Elijah for the most part is contained between first Kings 17 and uh, and second Kings chapter 2 and there's there's a few more mentions of Elijah in the Bible certainly but but there's not much out there about him but within that time that Elijah ministered we, we saw him he shut up the heavens and then he had a showdown a literal showdown with uh, the prophets of the of Baal and the prophets of the grove, and depending on who you think the prophets of the grove were, there was either 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the grove, or of Ashtoreth, or perhaps 800, you think it's 850 uh, prophets of Baal. It doesn't matter because the number is still 850. And there's this incredible showdown that comes. But, but one thing about Elijah when he gets to this showdown there was never any doubt that Elijah was there to speak what God had given him to speak. Matter of fact, you read it at the end of First Kings chapter 18. He says these words. He said, Lord, let them know. Let, let all of Israel know that I've done this at your word. Because I've heard your voice and because, God, I've been obedient to uh, your calling and I've been obedient to the things of God. And, and a matter of fact, one of the most remarkable things about Elijah literally comes uh, one chapter later after the victory on the mountain and after overcoming 850 prophets of Baal and, and just somehow assuming that the hearts of mankind would be turned back to, to the kingdom of God and that Elijah would speak the words, he finds this that, the, that hell is still strong and that hell still wants to cast its voice and so we find Jezebel threatening the life of Elijah and Elijah gets much uh, his heart's cast down and he goes into depression and we find him running uh, appears that he's running for his life and, and uh, so he goes uh, into the wilderness and, and the Lord sends an angel to take care of him and, and he ends up on the mountain of God and, and so we find a very interesting attribute about Elijah up on the mountain for he goes into the cleft of this rock and, and there's some that think it's the same cave that Moses perhaps was in when God put his hand over the cave and allowed the backside 
sides of God to pass by. And Moses, when he, when he walked out of that cave and after seeing the back parts of God, there was a change in the life of Moses. For the Bible says that the glory of God somehow filled his, not just his heart, not just his mind, but his flesh was changed because the glory of the God, God shone in the face of Moses. And, and some think that it was in that same cave where there was a transition of Moses that it was that's where Elijah was when the Spirit of God passed by and there was a fire and an earthquake and a wind and all of these things happened and let me tell you something when he walked out of that cave there was a change in his life I, I'm here to tell you today that God is in the business of changing hearts and changing lives and changing minds and drawing them closer to him let me tell you something that I believe in the power of prayer too many times I've prayed for something and I've seen the mighty hand of God come upon it. Too many times I've seen somebody who's been sick and needy and as we prayed that a miracle took place. I'm telling you something that there is a cave today that God wants to change your heart and change your mind and change your life and somehow allow the glory of God to minister through you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I could tell you I've been in that cave with the Lord and the Lord has changed my life. There are things I could tell you about, about God healing my body, about God healing my spirit, about God healing my soul, my mind, my intellect. Too many times God has come running when I have cried out to Him and there has been a change in my life. Amen. 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 That change isn't just for a prophet. It's not just for a pastor. That change is for every individual. It says, you know what? I'm going to climb up on that mountain and I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to hear the voice of God. I am not letting go of this mountain until I get a hold of Him. I promise you today that if you'll turn your heart, your soul, and your mind, your strength unto God, that God will come running to you. I promise you that today. I promise you that. Listen, I'm not just spouting some dead words, but I'm telling you that there is a Spirit of the living God that wants to live in covenant relationship with you and He will do whatever it takes in your life to draw you unto Him. Praise God. But there's a remarkable thing besides all of that that we find on that mountaintop. We find that Elijah was wearing a mantle. Because the Bible says that he pulled the mantle around his face. Now, mantle, uh, the first place we find it, it, it spoken about is when J.L. covered uh, Sisera with a mantle and it appears to be some sort of blanket or I, I believe more likely it was some sort of shawl uh, that Elijah wore around him and, and mantle you read it, you study it out for yourself. Samuel had a mantle. Elijah had a mantle. But other than that, it's not spoken about too much. But it's some sort of covering that was upon them. But I, I will tell you something. That, that mantle was such a telltale sign of who Elijah was. The Bible talks about the mantle of Elijah. And we see that mantle as he leaves the mountain. There were a few things that, that God had told Elijah that he was supposed to do. But one of the things that he had to do was he had to go find his uh, protege or the man that would replace him and his name was Elisha uh, so you have Elijah and Elisha and as Elisha saw the prophet of God coming and I believe that as he looked up and he saw that mantle he immediately understood this is nothing less than Elijah that has come into my presence and Elisha walked up and he took that mantle off in some way shape or form and I believe like I said it was some sort of shawl that likely came down in the front and covered down part of the back and maybe he did stay warm with it or he covered his head with it when he was cold I, I will tell you I'm not entirely sure and I don't know that we totally understand what it was, but it was some sort of garment. And as he walked up to Elisha, he took that garment, he took that mantle, and he laid it upon the shoulders of Elisha. I, I will tell you, it was by that act that Elisha knew and understood that there was a calling in his life. Let me tell you something. God is still in the business of giving mantles. He is still in the business of taking mantles off 
of the prophet and putting them into the lives of people. I will tell you that God is in the business of filling people with the Holy Ghost and there is an empowering, there is a telltale sign, there is a power of the Holy Ghost that comes upon us. I'm telling you here today that the church is called to wear the mantle of God, to wear the mantle of the prophet, to wear the mantle of power. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And so the Bible tells a story about Elisha following Elijah. Now I've preached this a number of times that Elisha, at least until the second chapter of the book of 2 Kings, he never did a single miracle that we know of. He never spoke prophetically, even though he had the calling of God. You see, God is empowering. God is empowering the church. He's empowering us to carry the mantle of God. And I'm going to tell you something. We don't all carry the same mantle. We don't all carry a prophetic mantle. We don't all carry a mantle of healing. We don't all carry a a, a mantle of encouragement or restoration. But rest assured that when God puts that mantle in your life, at some point in time, It's going to become powerful. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. After Elisha had followed Elijah for some period of time, there was a conversation, and if you would start back at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, and you would be able to read this entire conversation. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. But Elisha and Elijah are are leaving Gilgal, And Elijah says to him, listen, son, you don't have to go any further. God's getting ready to take me away. But but he said, so I just want you to stay here, and I want you to do what God calls you to do, but you don't have to go any further. Now, I'll tell you something. I love... I love Elisha's response. He said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, my calling right now is to follow the man of God, is to do, that's the will of God in my life. And even though the man of God said, turn around and go back, Elisha said, no, you don't understand. I recognize my calling. I recognize what I'm supposed to be doing for God, and that is following the principles of God, following the kingdom of God, doing the will of God. And it is the will of God for me to continue to follow you. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. It is the will of God for us to possess the deep things of God. It is the will of God for us to know Him in a covenant relationship. I'll tell you something. It is the will of God for power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost to be manifested in us because of the mantle of the Holy Ghost that has come upon us, praise God. But right after he has this conversation... The Bible talks about how the sons of the prophets came. Now, the sons of the prophets seem to be some sort of prophetic guild or, or a group of men that believe themselves or wanted to study being prophets. And, and from what I've read, you can trace it back to uh, Samuel, who went around setting these things up, these prophetic guilds. And, and it appears that they sought after God and that they wanted to possess the things of God. They all wanted to be Elijah is what they wanted to be. Now, you read about the sons of the prophets, and there are times that God used them mightily. But there's also times when you read about the sons of the prophets where the sons of the prophets are always spoken about in some sort of negative connotation. There's a negative speaking. And here we find that negative speaking about the sons of the prophets in in 2 Kings chapter 2. And the sons of the prophets came and said, you know what, Elisha, you don't have to go any further because the Lord is going to take your master away from you today. And, And so you might as well just stay here with us. Now, I want you to know something. It would have been a huge mistake for Elisha to stay with them. They said, you can stay here and you can, you can be the prophet in the stead of Elijah. But had he stayed, had he stayed and done the will of man, one thing would have happened. He would have been promoted by men. His calling would have been by men. 
it would have never been the anointing and the calling that God wanted to put in his life. I'm going to tell you something, that serving God isn't about finding the first fun place to stop and saying, okay, I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to do the will of man. No, I I will tell you something, when we're serving God and when we're reaching for the deep things of God, there is a pressing in and a pressing forward and a moving toward God. I I will tell you something, COVID has certainly shaken and has caused us to see that there are so many that want to stay away from the house of God and they they want uh, somehow to watch a video service and and think well bless God I heard the word of God today let me tell you something what you missed what you didn't get was that 30 or 40 or 45 minutes or whatever it was of that sovereign move of God that moved into this place that place of anointing and that place of calling and let me tell you something that what happened to the sons of the prophets was the fact that they had become dismantled that they no longer felt the power and the presence of God and they were willing to just make Elisha their prophet instead of Elijah by their calling and their will. I'll tell you today that the church is called to wear a mantle the likes of which have never been seen upon this earth. For Jesus Himself said these words uh, that uh, those... uh, I'm sorry... uh, My brain just took a little bit of a meltdown here. But he said, these signs are going to follow them that believe. In my name, they're going to cast out devils. They're going to speak with new tongues. They're going to lay hands upon the sick. And they're going to recover. That mighty and wonderful miracles are going to take place when you carry the mantle of the Holy Ghost in your life. But let me tell you something. We've come to a place where we're satisfied with a dismantled church. We've come to a place where we're satisfied with a dismantled pastor. We've come to a place where we're satisfied to walk in and hear some sweet little word of God that somehow brings us encouragement for the day when really what it should do is drive us to our knees in a place where we can find that mantle of God poured out in our life. Praise God. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. Tell you what. I speak to enough people and I get, I hear about, oh, our church is doing this and our church is doing that. And sometimes I tell you what, I just want to puke. I just want to puke. Well, we're doing all we can to flower up. You know, people just need to be encouraged. No, they don't need to be encouraged. What they need is the straight word of God. What they need to do is find that resident or that Holy Ghost residing in them and they need to put that mantle upon their shoulders and they need to know the power and demonstration of God in their own life. Let me say it this way. Jesus is coming back and when He comes back, the church that's leaving is going to be wearing the mantle. But those that have been dismantled, I'll tell you, I don't even like to think about what's going to happen. And I'm telling you today that we cannot afford to be dismantled in our Christian walk. Praise God. Not just once. Not just twice. But three times in Bethel. uh, Sorry, in Gilgal. And then in Bethel. And then in Jericho. Elisha had the exact same conversation with what appears to be three different groups of the sons of the prophets. And each one just said, you don't have to go no further. You just stay right here. You can just be with us. Oh, we'll just accept you the way you are. We'll accept you with all that. Hey, let me tell you something. I I believe that anybody, anybody, I don't care what sin is in your life, you should come to the house of God. You should come to the house of God. And you need to have a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ. You don't need a face-to-face encounter with Jeff Albertson or, or with any other minister. But what you need to do is you need to come to God because when God starts shining a spotlight in your life, those sins that you think are, are so valuable to you and you hang on to, uh, once God shines a light upon them, you're going to have a desire to set them down and to move on and to move in the power and demonstration of God. Or let me say it this way, you're going to have a desire to pick up the mantle of God. Praise God. Praise God. Not only do churches dismantle themselves, 
too many watered down pastors, too many watered down, too much watered down preaching, too much, you know, feel goodism out there. It's not Bible. It's not Bible. Oh, we can take the Bible and make it say whatever you want. Listen, you want to hear me make the Bible say whatever I think it should say? The Bible says this. It says Judas went out and hung himself. It also says go ye and do likewise in another place. You try to put those two together, and I'll tell you something. You're going to come up with something so ungodly and so so unholy and so unrighteous that, that I'll tell you, men have gotten clever. They have figured out how to connect verses that were never meant to be connected. And when they do that, they mis- dismantle the body. But I'm going to tell you this, that there are people that choose to be dismantled. They choose to walk around without the power and the authority of God in our life. I- I'll tell you something, we choose to walk around pr- in pride. We choose to walk around in unforgiveness. We choose to walk around holding a grudge. We choose to walk around in our own sins that we know come against the things of God, but we have decided we like them so much that somehow we think that God has to put up with them. Let me tell you this today, that God is looking for men and women that are going to put the mantle of God on, that they're going to serve Him the way He calls them to serve Him, and reach for Him the way that He desires to be reached for, that they're going to do the will of God. There's going to be a power that comes upon the church, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I'm going to tell you, I hate to say this. I had an interesting experience this week. Well, actually, it didn't just happen this week or, or, or last week. You know, the devil's pretty smart. He knows what causes us to trip and fall. I was talking to a pastor and he said I I want Pastor Albertson to pray this prayer because when he prays this is what happens and I rebuked him I said do not ever say that again because I am only what God has allowed me to be I am only what the Lord uses me for and if you think that somehow putting that mantle of being puffed up upon me that you somehow think that that mantle of pride is going to make me do this better or function in the kingdom of God better you are sorely mistaken because I will tell you something what God allows me to do and the visions he's given me and the miracles that that I have seen and the miracles that my wife has seen and that my son has seen and, and Richard has seen and others have seen God isn't just saving those for us but he's saving those for the individuals that would put on the mantle of God. I I will tell you something. There is a mantle that God wants to put upon you. There is a power. There is an authority. The kingdom of heaven has come near to all men and women. And I wonder today, would you reach out and take that mantle? Would you somehow find a place where you cast yourself upon God and say, look at me because God, I am a sinner. I am a rank sinner but what I want is to carry that mantle of the Holy Ghost I'm asking you God to put your power to put your kingdom to put your anointing to put your baptism in my life because God I want to be recognized by the kingdom of God hallelujah hallelujah this ain't no time for pride It's no time for self-pity. It's no time to carry a grudge. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. The Lord showed me some months ago. He showed me that there would be three three attackers. And uh, I watched. I didn't understand the entire thing and all that was going to happen. But then, not that long ago, the Lord showed me, I saw it, I watched it happen. He showed me that that last attacker, as I rebuked it, it fell over, was cast down. And then right after that, the Lord showed me two visions. The first one, I feel like, was the vision of Elijah when he went and prayed for rain. I saw what the Bible talks about, a cloud as of a man's hand. I felt like it was reaching out. But from the cloud of a man's hand, you read about 1 Kings chapter uh, 19, the beginning of chapter 19, I believe. When Elijah saw 
the cloud as of a man's hand. There was a deluge of rain that was poured out upon a land that had not been rained upon for three and a half years. Immediately or, or within a very short time after that, God allowed me to see something in the spirit. I, I was looking out over a valley, and from what I remember, it was a little bit of a gray day. But the Lord showed me the sky so brilliantly bright blue. Uh, like I think... I don't know that I've ever seen the sky that blue before. But as I looked at the sky, there was a giant cloud. When I say giant, it, it filled my vision from left to right unless I turned my head. But it filled my vision. It was so big and it was off in the distance. It was off quite some ways. I, I don't know how far, but miles and miles and miles in the distance. And that cloud wasn't just sitting there, but it was literally pouring out of heaven. It just poured and poured and poured and poured and poured and poured and wouldn't stop. And I saw it as it hit the ground and it just began to move out across the earth. Let me tell you something. God is moving. God is moving. And He's come. That cloud has come with an enormous amount, an innumerable, innumerable amount of mantles that God wants to throw on people. And I tell you today that God wants to put a mantle upon you. I don't care how bad you are. I don't care what you've done or what you think you've done. I, I've heard people say this, oh, if I walked in the church, the church would start on fire. You don't know the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't know the power of the one that rescued us from hell to extinguish the flames of hell. You have no idea. But let me tell you something. If you'll turn to God, if you'll turn to God today, you will find that mantle of the Holy Ghost in your life. You will find that mantle of love that God wants to pour out in your life. I, I'm going to invite those of us that are here to stand with me today uh, that we would stand and we're getting ready to have an altar call, but let me deal with what's going on in your homes right now uh, or your vehicles or wherever you are. I'm telling you that God has something for you today. He has something for you. Oh, you think uh, that, well, you know, I've missed it. I've, I've done this and I've done that. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. God is reaching for for those that will turn to Him, if you'll just turn to Him, if you'll reach for Him, if you'll come to a place where you say, I've got to have more of God. I'll tell you what, you reach out to us on our Facebook page because that's where you're watching us right now. And I'll tell you about repentance and how you turn away from things. I'll tell you about being baptized in Jesus' name and how God literally washes away every sin in our life because we take that step of faith. I'll tell you about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues and how God puts that mantle in your life. I'll tell you how you can live an overcoming life. And all you've got to do is want to take that mantle upon yourself. So right now we're going to cut this video off. But as we cut it off, I'm just asking you and I am imploring you that wherever you are that you would turn to God this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you today. Amen.